the ECB dropped a bombshell paper demonizing Bitcoin and demonizing Bitcoiners, more specifically, demonizing early adopters of Bitcoin technology, essentially explaining that they somehow have an unfair advantage. And the ECB also dares to make the argument that somehow, somehow the existence of Bitcoin is making everyone else poorer. Let's take a look at this. Welcome back, everyone. Let's dive into it because I, I, I definitely don't think that there are any coincidences. Uh, this ECB paper drops. Then we have that interview with Michael Saylor, essentially. Um, and again, I know it's up for debate and people are saying he's playing 4D chess and he's Trojan horsing the legacy system. But but also he made a very strong case for institutions custodying your Bitcoin. Anyways, let's dive into this because I do not think these things are unrelated. I think that this all has consistent messaging. Let's go through uh, essentially what the ECB claims are. Turdemeester put together an excellent thread summarizing all of the points. And of course, guys, as you know, all of my sources are in the show notes. I've put the, the link to the ECB paper that you can read over. It's 29 pages. I'm also going to put a link to the official rebuttal that was provided. So let's dive into essentially what the accusations are. And we're going to be using Ter de Meester's thread as our, uh, as our source for that. So the new paper is a true declaration of war. The ECB claims that early Bitcoin adopters steal economic value from latecomers. I strongly believe authorities will use this Luddite argument to enact harsh taxes or bans. Rather than praising Bitcoin as a tech paradigm shift a la petroleum and the internet, the authors introduce the blatantly Luddite argument that early adopters increase their real wealth and consumption at the expense of latecomers. So let's, let's talk about this for a second, because essentially early adopters, regardless of whether it's Bitcoin or any other technology or activity or practice or whatever it is, these people, the people that decide to do this, take on the most risk. Okay. And as a result, as a result, the volatility in doing so can be huge. And that means with that great risk naturally comes great reward. But of course, with that great risk could also come complete failure. And so the way that this is being framed is that it's almost like it's a guarantee, right? The people that were early to Bitcoin knew that they were going to become incredibly wealthy. All they have to do is just stand on the sidelines and wait while the poor peons show up and buy up all their bags. So again, you have to pay attention to the framing, okay? And the framing is very important because in order to get the average person to believe the demonizations of Bitcoin, this framing has to be in place prior. Number three, then they go on to blazingly advocate for legislation to prevent Bitcoin prices from rising or to see Bitcoin disappear altogether in order to prevent the division of society. Now, that sounds like a really good, really good narrative, makes me feel good, warm and fuzzy, right? The ECB is looking out for the average person's best interests. But make no mistake, make no mistake, that has nothing to do with it. Everything is about maintaining control, maintaining power, and projecting that power. So what the messaging here is, is very simple. Look, you can't take care of yourself. Let us step in and create the protective legislation, okay, that's going to essentially we're going to do our best to cripple and hamper Bitcoin as much as we can so that we can fit it into this specific mold that we want. So that way we can sell that thing as Bitcoin with our legal framework and our regulations. So 
Again, this is more of the then they fight you stage. Continuing on, number four, the authors also model some projections to illustrate the paltry amount of BTC that will remain available for latecomers. Woe is me, conspicuously left out, is the reason that has driven 15 years of Bitcoin adoption and development. It's simply better tech. Now, uh, what I believe Tur is referring to um, is he's talking about the, the block reward. He's talking about every four years, okay, we end up having the reward for every block mined cut in half. And that is a predictable monetary policy where what's happening is, is that less and less new Bitcoin come out onto the market. And the reason that this was done, the reason why the number was so high at the beginning was to help bootstrap the network. Okay. There's again, there's really nothing wrong with this. And to Tur's point, right? Um, 15 years. Okay. Like you've had 15 years of talking about Bitcoin and shame on the ECB because let's be honest, right? They've been crying about Bitcoin for at least the last 10. So to all of a sudden flip this narrative and, and make it seem like going forward, there's going to be this massive problem. Very disingenuous. And the other piece is this, right? Why do we accept this brainwashing that um, essentially the number of dollars has to go up in order for an economy to function and flourish? Like, why can't that number simply be absorbed into the purchasing power of the medium of exchange. Like, think about that. This is all this is, is I'm sorry to say this guys, it's a mind fuck. That's all it is, is a mind fuck. And what's happening is, is that the ECB is fear mongering, but also banking on the fact that people aren't going to think this through because again, we've all been trained to look up to and believe in authority. In all the years I've been monitoring the Bitcoin space, this is by far the most aggressive paper to come from authorities. The gloves are off. It's clear that these central bank economists now see Bitcoin as an existential threat to be attacked with any means possible. Many of us have warned that this was coming. Bitcoin as a major political fault line, both in national and international elections. Well, here it is. It means that us hodlers must take action to ensure that governments respect our basic right to hold property. And that's right, guys, this is, there's more than just Bitcoin at stake. Okay. This is property rights. This, what's happening is, is that free speech is being attacked. Property rights are indeed being attacked. Now, does that mean that we should all panic and say, that's it, we're done. They're going to win. No, of course not. This is an uphill battle. And in the end, okay, the one thing that any state does not want you to know is that as an individual, you have a choice. And as a, as an individual, you have a voice. Okay. So the longer that they can keep the majority of people believing that these things don't matter, right? That we have choices and we have voices. Well, they're going to be able to continue to play this, this game. Number seven, this will not be a war between haves and have nots. Rather, this will be a historic clash between those who stand for the natural rights of the individual and those who clutch at the failing ideologies of collectivism and central planning. This comment about this war between the, uh, the haves and the have nots, okay? Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the wealthy along with the poor um, had the option and the opportunity to accumulate Bitcoin. Um, earliest, at the earliest points in Bitcoin's history, you could have mined Bitcoin with a laptop. So if, if you were of the mind to take on a quote unquote massive risk, so to speak, um, well, you could have mined Bitcoin with your laptop or throughout as, as Bitcoin, as the Bitcoin ecosystem matured and grew. And if you, let's say, did not have optimal conditions for mining, well, then you could purchase your Bitcoin non-KYC with HODL HODL or BISC. Or if you just don't care about KYC, well, then you've got other platforms like Cash App. So the reality is, is that this nonsense, right? This nonsense that all the early people, right, uh, essentially uh, are going to get to benefit from Bitcoin's rise um, in, in indirect proportion. 
then the latecomers is complete bullshit. Okay. And I can give a, another example of that. Okay. A lot of the people who bought Bitcoin early on, um, they didn't come to it for the number, the number go up technology. A lot of them came to it for ideal, uh, idealistic reasons. Um, I mean, I've, I've said this hundreds of times. I came to Bitcoin for medium of exchange. I didn't even think about the NGU properties or anything like that. I needed, I believed I needed to use magic internet money and <laughs> I was happy to learn about it and do so. All that NGU stuff and understanding game theory and the philosophy behind it and all that all came much, much later. So my point is, is that a lot of the earliest adopters were very happy to give away Bitcoin, to spend Bitcoin as much as Bitcoin as they could. Okay, they just didn't care. They were having fun. So the idea that those people became exceedingly wealthy um, as a result of being early to Bitcoin is completely untrue. Now, another example that I can give is, is this, right? You have somebody that came to Bitcoin in, let's say, 2012 or 2013, and they've accumulated, let's say, 100 Bitcoin or 200 Bitcoin. Well, they've decided maybe to change their lives as a result, right? Because the fiat exchange of Bitcoin has gone up. The purchasing power by from each of each Bitcoin has gone up. So therefore, these people exchange their Bitcoin for goods and services. Now, over time, the number of Bitcoin that they have may go down, right? If they don't have a regular job, a regular form of income, some way to continue to purchase Bitcoin, then naturally that stack is going to deplete. Now, you have a person who just learns about Bitcoin. Let's just say that they had a fantastic job, right? Or they have a fantastic job and they've saved up right? They, they've saved up hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Which is quickly losing its purchasing power. And let's say they decide to come into the space, right? And for the sake of it, right? For the sake of the numbers, let's say they've managed to save up seven, eight million dollars, right? Let's give a number like that. Seven, eight million bucks. Well, guess what? They can go and buy 100 Bitcoin at least, okay? So they can go and buy 100 Bitcoin. And now all of a sudden, they have the exact same, the exact same amount of Bitcoin as that OG hodler that supposedly has this, um, this incredible amount of purchasing power overhang and um, this, this amazing early adopter benefit, supposedly. Okay. Now, the best thing about it is this, right? In, in Bitcoin, there's no winners and losers that are picked. So when Bitcoin then goes up from that point, guess what? The OG and the newcomer, they are both benefiting equally from Bitcoin's rise. Granted, you can make the argument that in fiat terms, it's not the same, right? The OG is sitting on 20,000 X or 30,000 X, whereas the, the person who came much later is only sitting on maybe 5X, 10X. Well, guess what? To a certain extent, that is the price of the risk that they took. But all of this, this whole entire rant to say the narrative that the ECB is crafting is complete nonsense. And Bitcoin is being demonized in order for the ECB to maintain its control and maintain its moat. This isn't over. It's not the last we're going to hear of this. Um, and I guess as a final thought, the one thing that I can say is this, after reading through all of this, I've come to the conclusion that it's a giant nothing burger. And why, why did I, you know, it's like, Phil, we just went through this whole thing. How's it a nothing burger? Okay. It's a nothing burger because of this. They're crying about Bitcoin. They're essentially hoping that you are going to believe what they say so that you can do what the ECB wants. They're asking you to believe them. Okay. That's what they're doing. They're actually begging you to believe them. Um, but yes, but yes, all that really happens. Okay. All that really happens is that the institutions begin to lose their grip on the money production as long as Bitcoin continues to live. Now it doesn't mean that they can't produce money anymore because of course they can, but Bitcoin is the meter stick, the unchanging predictable meter stick that essentially 
makes their game look exactly like what it is, which is completely foolish. In terms of Bitcoin impoverishing the rest of the world, this is complete nonsense. But as Bitcoiners, we have been saying this for a very long time, that as Bitcoin continues to gain in popularity and continues to gain traction, the governments that fear it most, the institutions that fear it most, are going to demonize it the most and the loudest. Because the truth is, the house of cards is collapsing. Money printing throughout history never ends in success. It always ends in failure, okay? And the problem is, is that most governments have run out of straw men that they can point to, okay? They've completely run out of them. So at this point, they need to make up a new straw man, a new boogeyman, and Bitcoin fits the bill. That's all I wanted to talk about today, guys. I'll catch you tomorrow. 